I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas possible, a terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you discussion can't, can with you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good evening and welcome to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. You're with the talk, we're on TV, we're on radio, we're online and we're on your smart speaker. Coming up in another devastating blow to the Tories, a new poll shows the Reform Party are just seven points behind them. Tories and Labour fighting out over knife crime with both pledging a crackdown on zombie knives. It comes as new figures show six thousand crimes went unsolved every single day last year and something funny happens to english footballers abroad stay tuned for this hilarious yet unbelievable clip of eric dyer giving an interview to the german press Good evening, Britain, and welcome to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham, right here on Talk TV. It's been quite the rollicking roller coaster week, from calls for Rishi Sunak to resign to Chinese officials trying to take over free speech at a British railway station. Tonight, we've got lots to tell you, loads to show you, and some incredible guests. We've even got some swearing parrots. Plus, it's Burns Night, and we've got a couple of surprises for you from north of the border. So get the whiskey decanter ready. I've got mine. This is the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. We are toasting tonight. Now, it's another day, another headache for Rishi Sunak, and this time from the pollsters. Polling by YouGov shows Sunak's Tory party plummeting to new lows with the Reform Party hot on their heels, just seven points behind. It's got the Tories on 20%, Reform on 13 and Labour way out in front on 48 Devastatingly, it's got the Tories losing every single marginal seat. Joining me now, Talk TV's Chief Political Commentator, Peter Cardwell, Director of Communications at the Henry Jackson Society, and Megan Gittos, uh, and broadcaster and historian, uh, Rafe Heidel Mancou. Very good evening to all Hi, of you. Hi, mate. Uh, busy old week for you, Peter. Yes. Um, I think you've been here pretty much most of it. Um, <laughs> so this new poll doesn't bring any great joy to Rishi Sunak. He hasn't got much, no. really, to be happy about this week. Well, it's it? just got worse for him. I mean, yeah. last week was a 20 points. This week is a 20 points as well. No movement whatsoever, no matter right. what he does. Conservatives haven't been ahead in a poll in two years, mm. and things just get worse. So the yeah. Labour, 28 points ahead of him, uh, ahead of his Conservatives, and Reform, really doing very, very well. 13 points in the poll. That is, the, I think, perhaps their best performance mm. that I've seen them at, uh, certainly within the last couple of years. So that is very, very significant. It is very significant. I mean, the trouble is, there's a lot of Tories out there, aren't there, who seem to think, though, that the polls don't matter. I was speaking to Tobias Elwood the night of the, uh, uh, the uh, sort of uh, attempted coup, if you like, which mm. didn't work at all, because uh, all the Tories decided to back Rishi Sunak. Um, and some Tory MPs were actually saying, oh, yeah, but we've got other polls which actually show we're doing much better than those polls. I mean, are they well, delusional? Well, a poll is only a snapshot of how people feel exactly this day, but we've got quite a lot of other evidence yeah. which shows that the Conservatives have done very badly in basically every electoral contest that has happened. We've got quite a few by-elections. We've got another two of them yeah. coming up in the next few weeks, and we'll see what happens there. I mean, the mm. Conservatives are really under pressure in Wellingborough. I'm hearing a lot from people in Wellingborough. For example, Peter Bone has stood down and his yes. uh, partner is standing uh, for the Conservatives. How's she getting on? Well, it's interesting. The way that this is sort of working out in Wellingborough. I think that Labour are running a very, very slick campaign. The Liberal Democrats don't think really, realistically, that they can win. Mm. And the Conservatives certainly have had quite a few complaints from people contacting me, people on the ground there saying that it's just not going, it's not as not as well managed as it should be. But listen, we'll see what happens. Mm. Um, certainly Keir Starmer would be hoping for a victory there and churning that red. But, but um, I mean, the big one, of course, I think it'll be on November the 14th, mm. could be totally wrong. But all the mood music, all the direction, every single poll, all the information we have actually publicly, the Conservatives may well have internal polls, but really they're a divided party. They've suffered a lot this week mm. this, with the Simon Clark thing. Actually, ironically, could have been better for Rishi Sunak, might have bolstered him slightly mm. and made him uh, a bit more supported by his MPs, but who, many of whom were very annoyed with Simon Clark. But at the same time, we're in a position where the Conservatives do not look as if they will be mm. in government 
in this time next year. Whenever, whenever the next election is. I mean, yeah. Megan, there doesn't seem to be really anything the Tories can do about the situation they're in. I mean, they they are where they are. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't matter if they get a new leader. It doesn't matter if they ditch Rishi Sunak. It doesn't matter what they do. If they have an election tomorrow, they lose. If they have an election in November, they lose. No, 100%. I think they could maybe um, change the polls just slightly. I've said this a few times mm. on your show. I don't know if... I'm quite shocked by reform. We've obviously we've not seen them that high. I'm yeah. not sure they can hold on to that. And will that tra actually transfer into a enough seats or, mm. or even or one even seat? One seat. One yeah. seat they yeah. might not win any seats. They right? might not... Even a 13 percentage point. Yeah. yeah, they probably won't win one. Um, I think... What's interesting here is that for the Tories, you are watching them. A lot of them are new, the, the new Conservatives. Mm. They're even calling themselves that. They're quite spoiled. Mm. Um, they came in with Boris and they think they're going to have a Boris moment and they're trying to separate themselves from their party. It's a bitter pill to swallow. It happens all the time when people even say, oh, I'll stand as an independent. Mm. No one is bigger than their party. There is not a politician no. in that no. house. I don't even think Corbyn is bigger than his party. Mm. And I think, is he actually think he stand? Will, I think he I is going to stand. Yeah. He is going to stand as an independent. Yeah. He can't stand as a Labour candidate. I think he's going to lose. Yeah. Because they, they fall they for it, don't they? They all think they're bigger than their they party. They all think they're all really, really important people. people. Know who, most people don't actually know who their MP no. is. It's actually a shockingly small amount of people who actually do. Um, and most people don't actually listen to the news every day. No. It's, it's Sometimes you'd be forgiven it being in the Westminster bubble that everyone thinks like this. I think the Tories are going to rise in the polls when it actually gets to an election and Labour are going to have to print a costed manifesto mm. and stop saying that everything's going to be paid for with a windfall tax. Yes. I think then it's going to start testing them. But right now, the rebels and the people that got elected under Boris, they're going to get a nasty surprise yes. that they can't separate themselves from number 10. Right. And, Rafe, it's all fallen apart rather suddenly, hasn't it, for Rishi Sunak? I mean, he's, he hasn't been in long, but it's sort of, he started all right, I suppose, because everyone thought, well, he might be better than Liz Truss was. But it's all just disappeared. The, the floor has literally fallen away beneath him. Yes, but the idea that there's anyone now waiting in the wings who can turn this around is for the birds. Uh. And that's why, you know, I mean, these Tory rebels are calling Sunak and his supporters delusional yeah. for thinking they can win the election. Well, I'm sorry, pot kettle black. Yeah. They're just as delusional for thinking that they've got the ability to turn this old war horse around. I mean, this war horse is, is going off yeah. to the glue factory, let alone anywhere else. Mm. And the reason the Tories are going to face oblivion, you know, a near, a near extinction-level defeat, isn't because of Rishi Sunak, it's because they've betrayed the British public for well over a decade. They haven't delivered on their manifesto right. promises, and the public are tired of that. They've been dicing with death for seven years now. Do you remember the yeah. last months of Theresa May's yeah. uh, tenure? You know, the Brexit party threatened to actually deliver a fatal blow and became the largest party in the European Parliament. Yes. In, 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 of all European nations. It was only Boris Johnson parachuting in that saved the Tories then, and there's no character like that mm. today, apart from Boris Johnson himself. But he's a much more tarnished figure well, now than I mean, he was then. Steve, Stephen Glover wrote a piece in the mail today, didn't he, saying maybe Boris Johnson is the only man that can save them. But I think <laughs> even now, at that point, because at least then there was Brexit to, to get done and you could you sort of manufacture a campaign based on that. Um, but they haven't really got anything they can manufacture a campaign on at all, which is puzzling to me as to why nobody decided to go along with Simon Clark. The other night. Yeah, but you can't turn the super tanker around and going with Simon Clark. I think there is a there is a, certainly an acceptance from many mm. conservatives I speak to that they're not going to win this election. But that that is the point where they reform, they see uh, which MPs are left, yeah. and that will absolutely be a, a major major factor mm. in terms of who the next leader is. Because if you have, I think quite a lot of these red wall characters may go, mm. uh, MPs may go, and then you may have a Conservative Party actually quite similar to the one it was in maybe. 2015, 2017, yeah. rather than 2019. And that could mean a whole lot of different things in yeah. terms of who the next leader is. Yeah, absolutely right. And what about the Labour Party? You've been talking to them as well yeah. uh, today. Tell us what they're up to. Well, I sat down with Yvette Cooper, the Shadow Home Secretary, and they're talking about knife crime uh, specifically today. The big question, of course, is they've got very ambitious plans. Yvette Cooper, unless there's a reshuffle, I think she's probably going to be the next Home Secretary. We'll see if, if Labour uh, win, but it looks as if they will. But Yvette Cooper was talking about knife crimes. She talked to me about immigration as well and a few other things. But really what they want to do is what the government has done, but further, faster, and in a much wider scope as well. But I put this question on knife crime to Yvette Cooper. This is what she had to say a little bit earlier today. We want to get this focus on tackling knife crime to start 
early and to make a difference around knife crime. We want to get neighbourhood police back on the streets and we want this action against the dangerous criminal gangs that are organising the boat crossings that are undermining our border security. Well, the dangerous criminal gangs have been around um, almost as long as the Tory party, haven't they? Um, and yeah, and it's interesting. A lot like, more successful. I was at the Downing Street press conference last Thursday, this yeah. day last week, and Rishi Sunak was talking about the legislation there, which Yvette Cooper and her party voted against, which has put 837 gang masters in prison, yeah. serving time. I asked Yvette Cooper about that as well. I said, what's wrong with that legislation? She yeah. said, actually, the number has declined, so the legislation has to be changed again, in her view. But really, a lot of what Yvette Cooper wants to do, she talked to me as well about having youth workers and AN E, for example. Yeah. I mean, a lot of that's just going to cost a lot of money. Yeah. And where it's going to come from, we keep hearing about the non domes we, money, we keep hearing about the private school money, possible windfall tax and so on. Well, actually, that cost of manifesto that was being talked about a little bit earlier on, that's something that I think people are going to run a big route, slide rule over to see yeah. where's the money coming from. Because if it's not coming from existing taxation, it can only come from borrowing or, of course, you and me as taxpayers. Well, I mean, there is that worry, isn't there? I mean, here's an idea for them. Why don't you put some doctors in the A&E and then maybe mm. they can actually see people who are going in with injuries. That's a really important point, I think, because um, doctors, enough doctors in A&E that aren't running into your room and running out of your room, they do vital work. Yeah. They um, separate children that are at risk from their parents and say, just say, right. double-check, you're OK. Right. They get men out of a room and say, I just need to speak to your wife, mm. who are showing signs of domestic abuse. So those youth workers that she's talking about, if we just got some doctors in A&E that were actually had time to do their job, right. a lot of these risk assessments could be done by a medical professional. Yeah. Also, by the time someone's stabbed, it's far too late. Mm -hmm. right. Why, what's a youth worker going to actually solve right. in an A&E? Surely the process by which you stop people mm. carrying knives and stabbing other people happens a lot sooner in right. the process. And the problem with these knives is that they're very easily available, aren't they? Because um, Talk TV did an investigation, I think, last summer, uh, Rafe, about how easy it would it be to get a hold of one of these. Because I was talking to people over the Christmas period. If you buy knives on the internet, you know, kitchen knives, they won't actually bring them to your house unless you sign... Um, the delivery that mm -hmm. you've, you've actually ordered them. But with these zombie knives, the people that are selling them, I mean, we were able to buy one on Facebook, I think, um, and it was delivered to a person uh, at an address that hadn't given an ID. Well, you know, with my think tank, we went to Norwich and I happened to do a trip to Great Yarmouth to see what it was like down there. And I yeah. saw a very shady shop with just these very knives on display Machetes in, the, in the window. And I took a photograph. I couldn't believe about yeah. it. But to go to the broader point, I watched the clip that you did with Yvette Cooper. And what I found most telling isn't what she said, it's what she didn't say. Mm. You know, there we saw her list her top three priorities. Knife crime, police on the streets... And I forget what the third one is now. Stopping the boats. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No mention of legal immigration by the homes by the potential no. future Home Secretary. Just like Rishi Sunak's five pledges: three on the economy, one on the NHS, fifth one stopping the boats. Mm. The fact that neither the Labour Party nor the Tories understand that for the British voter, it's legal immigration that is the most pressing issue for public yeah. services and for cultural and social change. And of course, we can see quite clearly: fifty thousand illegal migrants a year is terrible. But we've had over one million legal immigrants mm. with all of the implications that that has. Right. And none of these parties seems to be brave enough to tackle that very issue. The figure for 2022 is 745,000. But you're absolutely right, it is a massive... Well, it's gross, it. not net. We must never yeah, use one net point, figures. Yeah, it's 1.2 million, isn't it? <clears throat> net figures always assume that those who've left the country are the same as those who've arrived. Right. And when you're talking about cultural well, change, and, and people one who've the... left are very different. Yeah. They're, they're British people going to Canada, Australia, Spain. Yeah. And those who are coming have very different right. values. And it'll take, take much more to integrate them into our society. Because yeah. we keep hearing that we've got a falling birth rate and that we need to have more children, and yet the population continues to rise because more and more people are coming here. And also, the other thing is, is that uh, one of my bugbears is the numbers of people coming to study, people coming on student visas. You know, that guy in Nottingham, uh, who's just been sent down for manslaughter of the killing of those three people, he came here originally as a student and stayed, and an awful lot of them do. Um, you know, and obviously they don't end up doing what he did, but it, what it means is that, you know, the, the myth is, is put out there by the government that people come here to study, they contribute loads of money into the economy and then they leave. Well, a lot of them don't leave and a lot of them bring their families with them and that's why we've got so many people living here now. Yeah, it's absolutely true, Mike, and I think there are real, real problems with this. It's a massive issue, and it's not racist to discuss it. It's no. practical, it's reasonable of to course. discuss it. You've got, I mean, what I wanted to know from Yvette Cooper was at what stage do we, you know, what, what's a re... And I've never got an answer out of Labour for this. I interviewed Stephen Kinnock, one of our deputies, the shadow immigration mm. minister at the weekend. I spoke to him for nearly 20 minutes, and I, I asked him a number of times and said, what is the level that you want? Is yeah. 745 okay? What about 500? Oh, we, we, we'll look at the numbers when we're in government. Well, by that stage, you know, the 
manifesto is too mm. late. You need to put a number on it now. Yeah. We need to be very clear what kind of people we want in this country yeah. as well. Not races or backgrounds or ethnicities right. or whatever. Not that, but literally, do we need more nurses? Okay, let's recruit some nurses. Do we need more doctors? Are there are there real, actual, tangible problems in our uh, you know 100,000 right. care workers, for example? Bring those people here. I, I think most well, people, well, some people will be happy, some people wouldn't be happy. I personally would be okay with that if there are genuine vacancies. But the problem for a lot of people, I think, is the fairness aspect mm. around this. The fact well, that people like are not. Well, I'd like to see some political party coming out and actually admitting that we've got a huge number of people in this country who don't work, uh, who go below the radar, uh, who are antisocial, who are the sorts of people that are stabbing each other. And let's put them to work. Let's give them something to do and somehow solve the crime problem while at the same time solving the unemployment problem. Yeah. But one Sounds of like a great idea to me. But one of the reasons we think Keir Starmer hasn't given us a number is because, of course, he's aware of quite how radical his MPs are when it comes to yeah. immigration. Yeah. We know from all the evidence that Tory MPs are to the left of voters on immigration. Yes. So if Tory MPs yeah. are to the left, yeah, yeah. you can only imagine how far left radical Labour MPs will right. be. Absolutely right. Well, good to see you all. Uh, we've got much more to discuss, I'm sure. So some of you are staying, some of you are going, some of you will be back. Uh, it's all happening here uh, at the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. I'm coming up after the break. Lawless Britain will continue. Uh, will this country ever get a grip on crime? 6,000 cases went unsolved every single day last year. And politicians are in the trenches over zombie knives. Despite them being banned three times, they are still all over the streets. How are we going to stop them? Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. Mr Keir Starmer is uh, about to help make children even taller. Now oh, he's look! Taller. <laughs> that's, what, he goes. that's what's going to happen if you vote Labour. Long live J.K. Rowling and her right to stand up for women. We can only pity those who despise her straightforward politics as somehow dangerous. <laughs> So the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilch. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on Talk TV. <laughs> Sitting on his fat <laughs> talking for a living. <laughs> Like brought to you by Steve Khan, the mayor of London. You bought us with our own money, the the mayor's Thank fireworks. You. Very rarely meet anybody that says, you know, the thing about London is it's got a great mayor, <laughs> Steve Khan, brilliant guy. This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? I just cannot see if Rishi Sunak goes, does what David Frost, what Lord Frost wants him to do and go further to the right on taxes and immigration, that that would turn around than what's predicted by this poll. In a landslide, Donald Trump didn't just win, he obliterated. This is a guy facing nearly 100 criminal charges, and yet all that's done is actually make him more popular. Trump is canny enough to know that all publicity is good publicity. I don't want a president who's been impeached. If he's able to bamboozle you, that's the way it comes. I did my six months, I came back, nobody would touch me. I put my head down, I persisted, I carried on. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. I've asked you two questions. Should a mass stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that.
Welcome back. You're watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Britain's crime epidemic has been laid bare today with shocking new statistics revealing the extent of the problem. 6,000 crimes went unsolved every single day last year with a total of 2.18 million offences closed without a suspect being identified. Talk TV's Oliver Whitfield Mircic has the details. These latest crime stats released by the ONS will be a sobering reminder for Cleveland police about the tough work that they have got ahead of them. Cleveland police covers an area including red cars dotted on tees and here in Middlesbrough. Back in 2019, it was the first police force to be put into special measures because it was rated inadequate across all areas. It was only lifted out of special measures last year. The chief of police here will be happy that for the second quarter in a row, the rate of crime has dropped slightly. However, it remains the most crime-ridden part of the country, with 141.7 crimes recorded for every 1,000 people. It means that around 14% of people here were the victim of crime in the year to September 2023. Now, the rate of crime that we're seeing in terms of knives has shot up from 84 to 88. That is between 2022 and 2023. So while the Home Office, while ministers will be happy to see the number of crimes coming down, there are parts of this data set that will still present concerns for those in charge and the authorities. The Tories and Labour fought it out today over knife crime, with both pledging a crackdown on those horrible zombie knives. Joining me now, former Met detective Peter Blexley, um, Peter, the figures just get worse and worse and worse. I mean, with every sort of passing week or month, you just get something else that kind of slaps you around the face. I mean, 6,000 crimes a day going unsolved. I mean, that's incredible. And yet, James Cleverly, the Home Secretary, mm. went onto social media today to tell us all how crime is falling. They is keep it... saying that, don't they? They do, because stats are malleable, mm. they can be construed however you really want to construe them, to yeah. be honest with you. And crime stats are notoriously unreliable. Academics will tell yes. you that. Um, and, of course, many of them do not factor in, for example, the real elephant in the crime room, mm. which is fraud yes. and other online crime. And there are millions of those offences every year and they just don't feature in many of the crime stats. So the old figures right. are skewed and unreliable. Well, also, I mean, just before we came on air, there was a report that came out of Bournemouth, I don't know if you've seen this, five people injured in a free-for-all brawl uh, involving about 20 youths outside a college down there, casualties wheeled away on stretchers, literally sort of mass brawling in the street. This is the kind of thing that's going on in Britain up and down the country all the time. I mean, Oliver uh, reporting in there from the northeast. you know, people tell me that uh, on a night out in places like Newcastle or Leeds or Manchester and maybe even London, it's not unusual um, for you to get caught up in some kind of mass sort of street fight going on. And let's remember that this week we've seen a 15-year-old charged with the murder yes. of a 17-year-old in the West Midlands. Yes. And so, sadly, this appalling beat mm. goes on and on. Mm. And, of course, people's perceptions and their fear of crime is every bit as important as recorded Social. crime. And also, people's attitudes towards the police mm. is really important because I increasingly speak to victims of crime and when I say to them, did you report it to the police, most commonly they turn around and say, what's the point? Yes. Unless they need a reference number mm. for insurance purposes, yeah. then people are simply in their droves not reporting crime. And, I mean, it's a very broad area we're going to talk about here, but we can't not mention that situation, uh, the murders up in Norfolk, four people dead in a house, a call was made to 999, the police didn't appear to answer it. We've also got that terrible story in Skegness of the starving child found dead clinging to his father's uh, legs. Also, again, the police were told that something might be wrong, they didn't bother investigating. You know... It's one story after another, isn't it, where the police are just not doing the basics, it seems. It is. And let me tell you what I believe lies at the root of so many of the police problems. Believe it or not now, there are certain universities in this great nation mm. that have policing departments. Oh, yeah. There are people with doctorates in policing studies 
and the such like. Right. There are think tanks mm. that are solely dedicated to policing and there is an industry of magazines, a TV channel mm. and the like entirely dealing with policing. Right. So, therefore, heavily populated by very intelligent people with letters after their names. Excellent. And for all of the aforementioned, which has grown mm. in the last 20 years or so, I ask one question. Is policing better or worse yeah. because of all of that stuff? Yeah, exactly right. And what about all these crime commissioners we've got as well? What do they do? I mean, they seem to be sort of straddling over large, vast areas. They've got chief constables reporting to them. Uh, presumably they have an awful lot of meetings. But what do they do? Of course, they were the birth child of the Tory government. We were told that was going to result in more police accountability. Yeah. But, of course, they were not going to interfere operationally. Mm. And I think your question, what do they do, is a really apposite one. Mm. I've gone up against a few of them yeah. on debates in the media uh -huh. and this, that and the other. Right. And to be quite frank with you, none of them want to come back for another go <laughs> because I ask those kind of questions. Well, because you know about policing and they see uh, a paper about policing, which is not the same thing. Yeah, and they're very good at writing and, and drawing up lists yes. of what they've improved mm. and all that kind of stuff. Mm. Meanwhile, A and E is overflowing with yeah. people who've been assaulted. Right. Well, I mean, Labour's there with um, Yvette Cooper giving a great example of how politicians don't really get it. Talking about putting um, community workers into A and E's to go and talk to people who've been stabbed. Well, as I said, how about you put a few doctors in there and they can actually help them a bit more once they've been stabbed? Yes, I really think that is utterly ludicrous. Nonsense. It reminds me of when all crime was going to be... Crime and antisocial behaviour mm. was all going to be tackled because we were going to hug a, hug hoodie. a hoodie. Yes. And how did that work out? You see, you need to really separate kind of social work, mm. that which is the responsibility of other departments other people, mm. other organisations yeah. from police work. But many in the police say that one of their problems is that they get asked to do a lot of social work and it's not really for them. And they, they get tied up and their time gets taken away from them because of that sort of work that they're asked to do. Indeed they do. Mm. And it will be very interesting to see, as a result of this tragic case in Cossey in Norfolk, yes. what the result of the inquiry into why the police did not respond mm. to the 6am phone call. Mm. I want the police doing much, much more mm. police work yes. and not social work. Right. But I guess at some point there might be a balance that is struck, but let's not, let's not dance around the, the handbags here. Mm. Policing is in absolute crisis. Yes, it is. We have an incredibly young workforce, mm. very inexperienced. You've got sergeants with two years' service, yeah. inspectors with four years' service. Right. And in my day, they told me I wouldn't be a decent cop till I had five years in anyway. Right. I know policing's changed, but... And they will admit, insiders admit to me, detectives, by and large, these new detectives, are untrained, unqualified. They don't know what they're doing with complex, difficult investigations. Mm. We have probationary PCs teaching other probationary PCs how to do it yeah. when they barely know it themselves. Right. And we hear silence from those in the corridors of policing power. Yes. And shame on them for that, for not telling us the truth. Exactly right. And also, just one other point, finally, on the selling of these horrible knives, the zombie knives that we don't want to see on the streets, the machetes that people seem to be uh, waving around at each other. You know, I'm told it's very, very easy. We were able to, here at Talk TV, buy one of those machete knives um, last year, have it delivered to an address. No uh, ID was asked for, no ID was provided. They sold it on anyway. Um, surely that's easy enough to stop, isn't it? Well, this legislation, we're, we're told, is going to stop the manufacture and the sale and the distribution mm. of these. Well, has anybody heard of the dark web? Oh, well. Where you go on there and you can buy just about anything on planet Earth. Yeah. Unbelievable. I mean, it is a terrible, terrible situation we are in, but I don't see anybody getting us out of it, whether it is a remaining Tory government for the rest of the year, whether the Labour Party come in. You know, I don't see them having any great ideas about law and order. And we have so many of the intellectual elite in those powerful positions mm. in policing, those who are the senior officers who will become the next chief constables when current one stands down. Yeah. And so, unfortunately, I think this 
cycle will merely repeat itself. Mm. It's not going to be good news. If you've got teenagers out there as well, and let's not forget what happened in Nottingham, we'll be talking about that uh, coming up a little bit later on in the show. Peter, thank you very much indeed. Peter Blexley, they're always a sound voice of reason. You're watching The Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Get ready to toast your haggis, because I've got some scotch in my glass, and I'm joined by the one and only Alex Salmon for a Burns Night special. So stick to your seats. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about sport today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. Mr. Keir Starmer is uh, about to help make children even taller. Now oh, no. <laughs> that's, what, that's what's going to happen if you vote Labour. Long live J.K. Rowling and her right to stand up for women. We can only pity those who despise her straightforward politics as somehow dangerous. So the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds, so far result, nil, absolutely nil. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat <laughs> talking for a living. <laughs> Like brought to you by Sadiq Khan, the Mayor of London. You bought us with our own money, the, the Mayor's Thank fireworks. You. Very rarely meet anybody that says, you know, the thing about London is it's got a great Mayor, <laughs> Sadiq Khan, brilliant guy. This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? I just cannot see if Rishi Sunak goes, does what David Frost, what Lord Frost wants him to do and go further to the right on taxes and immigration, that that would turn around than what's predicted by this poll. In a landslide, Donald Trump didn't just win, he obliterated. This is a guy facing nearly 100 criminal charges, and yet all that's done is actually make him more popular. Trump is canny enough to know that all publicity is good publicity. I don't want a president who's been impeached. If he's able to bamboozle you, or that's the way it comes. I did my six months, I came back, nobody would touch me. I put my head down, persisted, I carried on. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. I've asked you two questions. Should a mass stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They've that won. is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that. This is Talk TV. Welcome back. Tonight on the Independent Republic of Mike Graham, we can't not celebrate our Scottish friends and gi ar adres tia haggis. Scotland's national poet, Rabbi Burns, turns 264 this year and Burns Night is an opportunity to have a kilt-raising, whiskey-filled good time in celebration. Now, who better to all lang syne with than Scottish actor Mr Lewis MacLeod? Or do we say Donald Trump? Great job. This is the soon-to-be president again, the Donald. I want to say a big hi and happy Burns Night to MC Micah G, Micah Graham, who's saving Talk TV. Mike G, he saves Talk TV. I'm great with rhyming. He's a great guy, funny, witty, ribald, intrusive, argumentative, contrary but a great guy. Burns was a terrible man. The way he treated Homer Simpson was appalling. But we're going to celebrate him tonight. I'm sorry I can't be with you, Mike, but you're a great guy. Congratulations on all your successes. You're doing a great job on that TV show. Hope to see you soon. God bless you. 
Oh, hi, the noodly hightly. I've got to say, uh, that's brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Uh, Lewis McLeod, of course, one of the great uh, Scotland's exports there. Um, joining our Birds Night party now, of course, who better uh, than the former First Minister of Scotland, Mr Alex Salmon. Alex, a um, uh, very, very happy Burns Night to you. Welcome to the Independent <laughs> Republic. Um, I couldn't get them to put any, um, uh, any sort of uh, Scottish flags around adorning the place, but I've got a little a wee dram here to Say, share Michael, with you. I noticed you weren't drinking very much on that glass. Are well, you sure that's the real stuff you've Oh, got it is, there? absolutely. It is absolutely the real <laughs> stuff, but it's early on in the show, so I don't want to get stuck in too early. But uh, tell us what you're up to on Burns Night. What's the deal? Well, I mean, I'm here in the northeast of Scotland, in Stricken. There's 400 people in Stricken Burns Club next door, but I've come to the quiet room so as I can hear you and uh, the uh, inimical Lewis McLeod. Yes, I mean, he's a great man. Are you going to be having an address to the haggis at some point? Ah, oh, fair fall, you're on a sonsy face, Mike. Uh, that's the haggis, not you, of course. Yes, no, but, of course. Uh, yes, of course. That, that's all. No, we've had our haggis, we've had our meats, we've had our tatties. Yeah. We're uh, digesting the whiskey and uh, everybody's having a, a fantastic time. Excellent. Well, I mean, I know you've got a couple of little um, ditties for us later on, but, I mean, it's going to be difficult to avoid talking to you about uh, Nicola Sturgeon um, and how she managed to call uh, Boris Johnson a fucking clown. Yeah, I think that's the, the highlight of, of Nicola's year, actually. <laughs> that's just the only, the, only, the only thing in the last year that's come out well for her. That should... Uh, that should uh, stay her execution by by, by a few moments, uh, since the, even the ranks of Tuscany could scarce forbear to cheer yes. uh, the description of Boris Johnson. The problem is that uh, the COVID inquiry here has not been good news for the, the Scottish government, not at all. No. Uh, and uh, the relatives, understandably, the people who lost loved ones during the pandemic, are, are spitting blood, and understandably so. Yeah, exactly right. And Jason Leach, who was, I suppose, your equivalent of Chris Whitty, has come out of it very badly as well. He was the guy who was the sort of advisor, wasn't he, on a lot of the medical manoeuvrings that went on, including telling people, don't worry about wearing a mask. As long as you've got a drink in your hand, uh, you'll be able to get around the rules. Yes, I, and I've been following his advice <laughs> over these last few years, Mike. I'm doing really well. Well, now, this the is the thing. Jason Leach is he's caught on WhatsApp saying... Uh, that he has a bedtime ritual of deleting his WhatsApps. Yeah. That was on a WhatsApp. Yes. <laughs> so obviously, his bedtime ritual was not infallible. Right. Uh, another civil servant was caught saying that plausible deniability was his middle name. Right. Uh, so clearly, they, they were all at it, uh, you know, queuing up to delete uh, incriminating evidence. Because basically, the problem is that, you know, they, they were having banter. You know, they, you know, I mean, most people are not full-faced about these things. You don't deny people's right to have a joke or two. But, you know, it's very difficult to see the humour in the middle of a pandemic when, you know, tens of thousands of people are dying. And well, so they'll tell jokes, they'll tell jokes about cannabis and, and, and the rest of it. Now, we're only seeing a, a snippet right. because the vast majority of the WhatsApps and, of course, all of Nicola Sturgeon's have been deleted. Uh, despite the explicit promises that they'd all be kept. Right. And I, I can't help but think that those who engaged in this mass deletion exercise uh, are in pretty hot water. Mind you, having seen Hamza today, who hasn't deleted as many as other people have, I can see perhaps why, why they deleted them. I mean, Hamza managed to insult the... Well, virtually every organisation in Scotland. They insulted the police federation. They called them... Uh, this grace, he insulted other MSPs. I mean, I mean, I thought you were the only person I knew that insults the entire population, but Hamza beat you to it. Well, indeed, and he made a very grovelling apology, didn't he? He sort of more or less said that everything that they did was unforgivable. Um, he couldn't believe that they'd done it. It's almost uh, as though it's a different person speaking because, of course, what people might forget down here in London, in Westminster, is that he was the Secretary... Uh, uh, professionally, the Secretary of State for Health, wasn't he? The Health Minister. So he was involved in an awful lot of what was being done. Well, he was involved... He was the Secretary for Health in the second half of the the COVID the pandemic, after the, the summer of 2021. Mm. Uh, but even when he was Secretary for Health, you couldn't help the abiding feeling that he wasn't really making any of the decisions. The, the decisions apparently were all being made by Elizabeth Lloyd, who mm. was the 
senior special advisor to Nicola Sturgeon and Liz Light. I mean, she seems quite happy by giving the impression that she was calling the shots and, and running the government after hearing her evidence. Didn't seem any need for anyone else but her. No. Uh, which might explain why, why things didn't go entirely smoothly. No, quite. I mean, um, and are you curious as to what WhatsApp messages that may have been involving things that were said about you uh, that have now suddenly gone missing, that have been suddenly <laughs> well, wiped from noted, the memory? It has been noted in the social media yes. that, uh, strangely enough, all WhatsApps between March and September 2020 have been deleted. Ah. Even Liz Lloyd, who turned up with uh, some WhatsApps after September 2020, couldn't explain why, for some unfathomable reason, the March to September ones weren't appearing. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't be at all surprised if uh, there had been some... I mean, I'd be on the receiving end like the Police Federation and other MSPs, and perhaps even worse. You know, I, I, I really think what we should be doing uh, is getting the Chinese or the, or the Russians to tell us what's in these WhatsApps. I mean, they, they apparently can read everything, so yes. maybe we should be putting that imploring the Chinese or Russian governments to tell us what's been deleted. Well, or even perhaps go to the tech companies uh, and see if they can actually be retrieved. Because I'll tell you this, and this is what's really worrying. The act of deleting these WhatsApps comes with a great political cost. So that tells you, it tells me at least, that whatever's in these WhatsApps must be pretty bad yeah. to take the cost of deletion and the, the odium and the infamy of this delete uh, policy, to actually have exercised actively the deletion of evidence and take all the criticism that's going to come your way because of that, whatever was in these WhatsApps must be pretty damning. Yes, on the basis that what would have come before the public would have actually made it all worse. We've seen some of that uh, in the inquiry down here in London. Uh, Boris Johnson famously didn't want to, um, you know, lose all the WhatsApps by switching on his phone and so was unable to supply some. And certainly um, Lord Bethel also similarly changed his phone and lost all of his WhatsApps and he was in the, uh, the, the, the Ministry of State for Health as well. You know, it's all, they're, all at, they're all at it. Yes, of course they are. And, and, you know, therefore, having the Tory leader in Scotland seems to forget that uh, the Prime Minister didn't turn over any WhatsApps. Boris Johnson had a smattering, as you rightly say, people in the health department. I mean, everybody seems to have had very jittery fingers and dropped their phones and baths at various points over the, over the, last, uh, over the last year or two. Uh, I mean, you know, the Westminster stands no better than, than, than Scotland in this. In fact, if you if you add on the, the various Westminster parties and all the rest of it, uh, substantially worse. I think one difficulty for the Scottish government is this: uh, I mean, they gave the impression and were anxious to give the impression that they were doing so much better than the politicians at Westminster. Yeah. And of course, it can hardly still be argued in terms of communication. Uh, Nicholas Sturgeon was a superior communicator to Boris Johnson. The trouble is, as you've kind of lifted the behind the scenes and had a had a, a look at what was actually going on, th there's something off the Whitehall Westminster attitude towards the pandemic, pretty screaming out from these WhatsApps that have been revealed mm -hmm. in Scotland. The, the same attitude as uh, you know we've got to delete everything in case people ever find out what we've been talking about. Right. Ho ho ho. And it really doesn't wash in a situation. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty relaxed about these things normally. Mm. But, you know, this is not the sort of situation where people should have been joking behind the scenes and having a good laugh at no. all the, the things and that were going the serious, on. I mean, it really doesn't, it doesn't sit well. No, and also the serious nature of it is also, surely, that if it was all being orchestrated by Jason Leach and it was almost official policy to get rid of anything that might be incriminating or it might be difficult to see in hindsight or might be dodgy, you know, that, in some people's eyes, would be called a conspiracy. And it could lead to some kind of law-breaking, could it not? I mean, I'm looking at a story here uh, from the papers today saying that the SNP is already now at the centre of three police investigations. That's right. I mean, you know, <laughs> if there's enough police investigations about to get them on something, I would hope. <laughs> but uh, I but mean, no, so I mean, it's like the bad. Donald Trump of uh, Scotland. Yeah, well, <laughs> that's right. Well, <laughs> unfortunately for the SNP, it's not having the same political effect. You know, every time <laughs> there's another indictment against Donald Trump, his poll ratings go up. That I'm afraid that's not happening for the SNP uh, in Scotland. But you know, there's a bit of a serious side to this. And, you know, remember, of course, Nicholas Sturgeon made an explicit commitment 
during a COVID briefing to the journalists on Channel 4, mm. that WhatsApps and these messages would be kept. And also, some of the stuff that's come out does indicate, of course, that some decisions were being made effectively by WhatsApp and in informal communications. And, and you really need these messages to get a proper grasp of, uh, of what was going on. Do you think this, this, this is when Nicola called Boris uh, an effing clown? <laughs> or was it another well, occasion? <laughs> I mean, I wonder whether that, that was uh, just one of the occasions when she called him that. I mean, there was a spoof tweet that went out earlier on today. I don't know if you saw it, uh, at which she was supposed to have been rather colourful about certain other people in the cabinet. But, it, I mean, it's so believable that everyone fell for it. Turns out it wasn't actually her. Um, so we well, there's, some, there's some speculation, of course, in the missing messages. She may not be too complimentary about people in her own cabinet. Well, <laughs> Which would be, would be one that... reason for deletions. Well, I think it's fair to say, and, and, and you know, you've spoken about your friend, your previous friendship with Nicola Sturgeon, and your, your kind of tutelage of her to some extent as a politician. That you know, um, she obviously got to, she obviously got to a point in her sort of power crazed manner that she thought she could get away with saying anything she liked and doing anything she liked. Well, you know, Nicola once said she had an imposter syndrome. Uh, uh, you know, she suffered from it. She said that in an interview once, and. There's no much sign of an imposter syndrome. <laughs> I think it's probably whatever the reverse of the imposter syndrome is. I mean, maybe during a huge health emergency like the pandemic, the likes of which you've never seen before, perhaps, you know, that has a kind of psychological effect on people, uh, for better or for worse, yeah. who knows. But, uh, but whatever the psychological, whatever the interpretation is, it is a very, very, very difficult situation to explain the mass deletions of messages after a solemn commitment to retain them and in the full knowledge that the inquiry was, ex or inquiries, I should say, were expecting to see them. Yes. That is very, very difficult to explain, not, not just to the bereaved relatives, that, that's very difficult to explain to the population as a whole. Absolutely right. Speaking of people who have got problems, um, I'm just seeing a bit of breaking news here that uh, Baroness Moan uh, has had her assets frozen, uh, which doesn't sound very pleasant at all. Um, apparently, about £75 million pounds worth of assets linked to Baroness Moan and her husband have been frozen or restrained by court order as they face a national crime agency investigation into alleged fraud uh, of those PPE contracts. So, um, not a good day for her either. No, but that's only a few hundred million to go, Mike. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> so, they're not that that's a, that's a spit in the bucket. Yeah, absolutely right. We'll be talking more about that as the show goes on. Alex, let's hear your uh, your uh, Burns uh, impression because you've got something to say. I think you've got a few lines for Keir Starmer and Rishi Sunak. And should we start with the SNP? Well, the, well, well I, I thought for the SNP, it's uh, a little known uh, of. Uh, of uh, Burns' works, uh, here's, a, here's a health, it's called. Uh, here's freedom to him that would read. Here's freedom to him that would write. Uh, there's nothing to be feared that the truth should be heard. Save them that the truth were in doubt. <laughs> yes. That's a message could my ex-colleagues could, could ruminate on yes. in the days and months ahead. And they know who they are, right? Yes, I'm sure they do. I'm sure they're having a very miserable Burns night, unlike you. Um, do you want to give us a, a few lines on Sunak while you're at it, before we go? Well, I, I mean, for Sunak, I mean, you know, I, I thought for the, the two main protagonists at Westminster, I should do just a wee excerpt from two a louse uh, for the Prime Minister and two a mouse for Sir Keir Stammer. Yeah. Uh, so uh, two, a, two a louse should be for the Prime Minister. Uh, oh, had some poor the gift to give us to see ourselves as others see us, it will add through many a blunder free us and foolish notion. I don't know if you need a translation of that, Mike, or, or can you just get the sentiment? I think to see ourselves as others see us has always been a great line. I shall, cho I shall toast you uh, one more time. Um, happy Burns and, Night. Uh, how about Sir Keir? We can't, we can't go without Sir Oh, Keir. sorry, go on. We slick it, cool and timorous beastie, up in a panic in thy breastie. That is, that is certainly true. He doesn't know what to do. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Alex Salmon, former First Minister of Scotland. Um, in a pretty and, good place, and, I would and say. Listen, you've, turned, you've turned down the, the stricken Burns Club uh, for the 10th successive year of doing an immortal memory, Mike. Can I, can I put you... Can I go back to the Assembly next door and tell me you're a certainty for next year? I think you can. Absolutely right. I'll, I'll, I'll make it a date.
No problem at all. And we want new jokes. Yeah, I'll bring new jokes, don't worry. I say that's all I do. Very good. Alex, thank you very much indeed. Alex Salmond there, reporting in uh, from the north of Scotland. Burns night, indeed. Uh, raise a glass to it, if you wish. Now, you're watching uh, The Independent Republic and Mike Graham. Are you looking for a new side hustle that involves being fed bananas by strangers all day? Because, boy, do I have something for you after the break. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about sport today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. Mr Keir Starmer is uh, about to help make children even taller. Now oh, we'll look! <laughs> that's, what, that's what's going to happen if you vote Labour. Long live J.K. Rowling and her right to stand up for women. We can only pity those who despise her straightforward politics as somehow dangerous. So the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat <laughs> talking for a living. <laughs> Like brought to you by Steve Khan, the mayor of London. You bought us with our own money, the the mayor's Thank fireworks. You. Very rarely meet anybody that says, you know, the thing about London is it's got a great mayor, Steve Khan, <laughs> brilliant guy. This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? I just cannot see if Rishi Sunak goes, does what David Frost, what Lord Frost wants him to do and go further to the right on taxes and immigration, that that would turn around than what's predicted by this poll. In a landslide, Donald Trump didn't just win, he obliterated. This is a guy facing nearly 100 criminal charges, and yet all that's done is actually make him more popular. Trump is canny enough to know that all publicity is good publicity. I don't want a president who's been impeached. If he's able to bamboozle you, or that's the way it comes. It'd be my six months, I came back, nobody would touch me. I put my head down, I persisted, I carried on. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. I've asked you two questions. Should a mass stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that. Welcome back. You're watching The Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. A scenic area in China's Hubei province is hiring people to dress up like the monkey king, Sun Wukong, to hide in a cave while being fed by tourists for two to three hours. The pay is said to be the equivalent of 850 US dollars. It's gone viral online now with many, well, many nutters, you might say, saying that it's the dream job. Dream job. You're having a laugh. Unbelievable. Absolutely incredible. Very strange what they get up to in China. Um, now, however, it is time for Taking the Mic. You've heard the one about the dodgy immigration lawyers. They're the people that help illegal migrants ensure that they can pass muster as asylum seekers after they've been given a nice hotel room to stay in. The ones who know every trick in the book to get around the system. Tell them you've got family here. They'll never be able to check. Tell them you can't go back to your own country because people there will kill you. Tell them you're suffering from a fear of water. Tell them you're gay and that's illegal where you come from. These chances will do anything to make a buck and they don't care who suffers as a result or who pays in the long run. Of course, the bleeding heart liberals and the race baiters will tell you that these dodgy lawyers don't exist, that they're all figments of your imagination and that you must certainly be a bigot for even thinking that anyone coming here isn't desperate, traumatised and in need of our help. 
Last July, we discovered there were three separate law firms where crooked lawyers were creating fake asylum and human rights claims for illegal immigrants. In one case, a legal advisor told an undercover reporter that he could invent claims of sexual torture, beatings, slave labour, false imprisonment and death threats. At another firm, another lawyer offered to create evidence to make it appear that a reporter had a genuine fear of persecution and assassination. These crooked lawyers claimed they had a 90% success rate as well. But luckily, the solicitor's regulation agency did their job and suspended those firms in question. But still, the immigration business, for that is what it is, goes on apace. Only yesterday, the Home Office arrested three more people posing as immigration lawyers and offering to help illegal migrants make bogus asylum claims for a fee of 10,000 quid. Home Office officials raided the suburban home from which the business was being run. They said those arrested were a mixture of British and Chinese origin and they're believed to be part of a bigger company that supplies fake documents to fake asylum seekers. This business has got to stop and it's good to see the Home Office actually doing something. But there's hundreds of people profiting from the illegal business of people trafficking. There's millions of pounds to be made and our legal system is helping it to happen. If only someone from the House of Lords was paying attention. That was taking the mic. Now, a funny thing seems to happen to our footballers when they go abroad. Britain, Eric Dyer has been mocked by fans. He did an interview following his Bayern Munich debut in Germany. He's been accused of going full Steve McLaren with supporters claiming he's now got a German accent after just one week in. Yeah, a very proud moment for me, obviously, to make my, to make my debut for this club. Um, it's, a, it's a very proud moment for me and my family, and um, obviously I, I, I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed uh, playing here. I'm happy to have made my debut here in, at, uh, in this stadium. Yeah, now I've listened to how he usually sounds. I think the first two days have been really positive. Um, we've enjoyed training. You know, tomorrow will be actually the first time everyone's trained all together because there's been a couple of boys that are still on their second day recovery after a game. So, um, yeah, looking forward to tomorrow, but the first two days have been really good. You're watching The Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Coming up after the break, we've got a sequel to The Piano Man Saga, so stay right there. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. Mr Keir Starmer is uh, about to help make children even taller. Now oh, no. <laughs> that's, what, goes. that's what's going to happen if you vote Labour. Long live J.K. Rowling and her right to stand up for women. We can only pity those who despise her straightforward politics as somehow dangerous. The amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat <laughs> talking for a living. <laughs> Like brought to you by Sadiq Khan, the mayor of London. You bought us with our own money, the, the mayor's Thank fireworks. You. Very rarely meet anybody that says, you know, the thing about London is it's got a great mayor, Sadiq Khan, <laughs> brilliant guy. This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? I just cannot see if Rishi Sunak goes, does what David Frost, what Lord Frost wants him to do and go further to the right on taxes and immigration, that that would turn around than what's predicted by this poll. In a landslide, Donald Trump didn't just win, he obliterated. This is a guy facing nearly 100 criminal charges, and yet all that's done is actually make him more popular. Trump is canny enough to know that 
All publicity is good publicity. I don't want a president who's been impeached. If he's able to bamboozle you, or that's the way it comes. But in my six months, I came back, nobody would touch me. I put my head down, I persisted, I carried on. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good evening and welcome back to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. You're with Talk, we're on TV, we're on radio, we're online and we're on your smart speaker. Coming up in this hour, BBC show Dragon's Den is caught up in a fakery storm after an alternative medicine was promoted without scientific evidence. The entrepreneur claims producers recruited her for the show. Oh dear. A death row inmate is set to be executed using nitrogen for the first time in US history after losing his last minute appeal. A potty mouth Polly. A flock of parrots are rehomed due to their foul language. We sent our reporter to meet them. Now, a story we broke on Monday has made headlines around the internet and around the world following our interview with Brendan Kavanagh. The pianist was confronted by a group of Chinese tourists who demanded he didn't show videos of them during a film performance in St Pancras train station. Even though Kavanagh was filming in a public place, he was told by a police officer not to film. They've requested that the video where they've approached gets deleted and not used on your channel. No, they because don't there's money mind. being made and they work for a company and their faces can't be shown. Well, they, they shouldn't be in, in that. That's, you're not their private security agent. I'm not their private okay. security agent. And we're in a free country. We're in a free space. We're not causing the trouble. The problem is not from us, Kerry. The problem is they are coming over, telling us what to do, and playing the piano. Now, fair is fair, but you are not their private security guard. We're not in China. And that's not racist, that's the truth. That's what our exactly, forefathers thought for. Exactly, but you can't say things like that either. You can't just say things say like what? that. That we're in a free country? No, that we're not in China. Absolutely incredible story. The piano, of course, was then corded off by the station by high security, uh, but in a turn of events, it's now back open to the public, and Brenda's told us he plans to play it tomorrow. Now, here's what the company that owns the piano had to say on the matter. Maintenance works at the main concourse of St Pancras Station are now complete. The Elton John piano is back in its usual location and remains open for public use. Just be careful who you film. Uh, while you're doing it, of course. Later on in the show, we'll be bringing you a first look at tomorrow's front pages with the panel. But before anyone else, we've got an exclusive look at the Sun newspaper. And today, they're going with a story about Coronation Street legend Bill Roach, who apparently faces being made bankrupt at the age of 91. He's been formally petitioned by HMRC over his tax affairs at London's High Court. In the past, it says the actor was among hundreds who invested in an offshore firm later deemed to be a tax avoidance arrangement. Um, so, I mean, this is a man who has been on television longer probably than anybody in this country. Father of five is still in the ITV soap after first appearing on the cobbles of Coronation Street in 1960. And he was once its highest earning star on £250,000 a year. Amazing stuff. Um, over to the other side now, though, because the BBC is under fire for casting an entrepreneur to try and flog what she calls ear seeds on Dragon's Den. Giselle Boxer claims they helped cure her ME, but doctors are warning that they have no medical basis whatsoever. Let's take a look at her pitch. Four years ago, I was diagnosed with ME. I was told by doctors that I would never recover, work again or have children. I went on a personal healing journey using diet, acupuncture, Chinese herbs and ear seeds. Using this combination, I believe, aided my recovery within 12 months. They are tiny beads which stick onto the ear. They send signals to the brain and body to relax the nervous system, release endorphins and naturally relieve pain. Now, Giselle since come out and said that rather than applying for the show like the other contestants do, she was actually contacted by a researcher to take part. And interestingly, despite business tycoon Stephen Bartlett offering her 50 grand for a stake in her business, it's not Stephen who's listed as a director, it's his brother Jason 
and the company's mysteriously changed its name from AccuSeeds to East Healing Limited. I'm joined now by former Top Gear presenter, Mr Steve Berry. Steve, very good evening to you. Welcome back. <laughs> good evening, Mike. Good to see you. I see there's a bit of a delay. Um, obviously, you're not actually in any kind of foreign land. You're just here uh, in Manchester, I'm assuming. Um, this is a bit of a problem for the BBC, isn't it? Because if it turns out that all of these people that appear on Dragon's Den have actually been kind of invited on as opposed to applying, that sort of does away with the, uh, the whole point of the show, doesn't it? Yeah, I think we've got a problem with Steve Berry. Uh, he doesn't look as if he's able to hear what I'm saying. So we'll, don't worry, we will come back to that. Uh, looking at the uh, front of the sun once again, they've also got a story uh, which we're going to look at later on as well and about the, uh, it's about the uh, uh, sentencing of Valdo Callocane who killed three people in Nottingham last June, of course. The families are furious at the fact that they have not got the justice that they think that they deserved. Um, the parents of both of those 19-year-old students who were killed have been very outspoken. Uh, they say justice was not done. He's been detained in a hospital rather than tried for murder. He was able to plea manslaughter uh, because of diminished responsibility, of course, as well. So it's been a terrible, terrible time uh, for the families. They've had to sit through uh, the courts and, and, and look at this man uh, who murdered their children. Uh, and it's been absolutely awful. And they say that they were never really properly told exactly how it was all going to pan out. And they were under the impression that he would definitely go to prison for a very, very long time for murder. Absolutely dreadful story. We'll come back uh, to all the stories in the papers. And as I told you uh, while I was talking to Alex Salmon, um, Michelle Moan is back in the papers as well because she's had all of her assets frozen. Um, or not maybe all of them, but certainly £75 million pounds worth. Um, but we'll come back to all of that coming up as well. Let's go over to the United States of America, though, because an Alabama death row inmate is expected to become the first person in the United States to be executed with nitrogen gas after losing several last-minute appeals. 58-year-old Kenneth Eugene Smith was convicted in 1989 of murder. Smith would be the first person to be put to death by this method in the US. And according to the Death Penalty Information Centre, anywhere in the world. Joining me now is the Deputy Editor of The Spectator, Mr Freddie Gray. Freddie, very good uh, evening to you. Welcome to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Um, I've been good evening, Mike. I've been hearing about this story pretty much all day today. Um, and... Many, many states in the United States now have given up on the death penalty, but Alabama obviously isn't one of them. But this is causing an awful lot of angst, isn't it, for people, even those who actually are in favour of the death penalty, because of the method that they're going to use? Well, yes, because it seems to be uh, untested, or at least we have no idea what the testing that has been done, uh, the results are. Right. Um, it's, uh, it's poisoning people with noxious nitrogen gas, so cutting out the oxygen so they just breathe nitrogen. Um, and some experts uh, say this is the most humane possible way to kill someone. Other experts say it's highly likely it could be extremely painful uh, and an awful way to die. And it's an extraordinary situation that, um, th that uh, Alabama is about to try this on someone uh, when it hasn't been tried. And I, I don't know where you are on the death penalty. My, I'm a bit of a softie. I'm, I'm against it. Yeah. Um, but I think uh, this is a particularly odd example and it's it's interesting that america although there's always been uh, the death penalty america sort of federal death penalties faded out in america uh, for a long time uh, and they appear to be coming back a little bit actually it was under donald trump that they started to come back a little bit uh, and there have in recent years been um failures been yeah. death penalties that went wrong i believe it even happened to the uh the criminal in this case yes um last year and so there's an, that that um, brings up another legal question which is if the state tries and kills fa tries and fails to execute someone uh do they can they try again yeah uh, these are very murky waters and and to me it's very creepy stuff i, d I don't think we should be um gassing people uh, particularly if we don't know what the um what the effects might be no matter how awful they may yes. be and no matter what terrible crimes they've done Yes, no, I'm like you. I mean, I, I do... I am persuaded occasionally by arguments about 
paedophiles and child killers and people who cannot ever really be rehabilitated and that we perhaps shouldn't spend an awful lot of money housing until the day that they die in some kind of penitentiary. But, but no, I'm, I'm like you, I'm a bit squeamish about the death penalty. And what I do know from my time working over in the US is that an awful lot of people spend an awful lot of time on death row, sometimes 20 years, sometimes 30 years, and it costs a great deal of money. Um, I had one encounter with a... Um, uh, a death row sort of death chamber, if you like. I was once in Mississippi and I was invited by the head of this prison to come down and do an interview with him about this new um, uh, boot camp that he was running for sort of miscreant young people. And he said, um, you know, we've got an electric chair here. And I said, yeah, OK, I see. And he said, would you like to see it? So he took me into the place where the electric chair was and went, do you, like, do you want to sit in it? And I went, well, not really. No, I don't really think I'd like to do that. That's not on my bucket list. And, and it was very weird because, as you know, people in America who are in favour of the death penalty think it's a great big joke. You know, I've been to um, prisons where it, executions have been carried out and there's parties going on outside. You know, people are, are flipping hamburgers. You know, when Ted Bundy was executed, uh, somebody was selling Bundy burgers outside the prison where it was going on. And there's bands playing, people drinking beer, and it's like a sort of tailgate party at a football match. Well, it taps into a side of the American psyche that I think foreigners don't really understand. Uh, I mean, and, and I'd say the gun issue does this as well. Yeah. Um, Americans have a do have a rather Wild West attitude um, to justice. Mm. Uh, and that means that, you know, brutal punishment uh, can be accepted quite easily. I'm obviously I'm talking in extremely broad brushes here because uh, it's a very controversial issue even in America. Yeah. But there certainly is this sort of, you know, to hell with them uh, attitude. It's far more prevalent uh, in America than it is um, in Europe. Uh, and it's very interesting to know why that is. Yes. Uh, and I think it's probably something to do with the, the sort of the, the, the frontier mindset uh, that you have in America that, that, that where, you know, justice was the only thing that could save you from quite brutal crimes. Yes. Um, I, I there's always think... this fear of... Uh, you know, the, the, the brutal monsters in out there in America. Yes. And I think it does also kind of highlight the differences between Europe and America. You know, while certainly in Britain we count ourselves as, you know, having a special relationship with the US and a lot of people, you know, um, go and live there and work there from here. A lot of Americans come and live in Britain. And, you know, there are many parts of America that are very similar to Europe, but there's large swathes of it which really aren't. Um, yeah. which, which kind of brings us on to Donald Trump, really. He's in New York... Uh, today. He's been uh, up against um, E. Jean Carroll in that defamation case. Now, we're told that the judge has already ruled that he defamed her. This is a woman um, who claims that he sort of sexually assaulted her and then went on uh, afterwards and defamed her. He's claiming he's never met her. The judge is about to uh, make some kind of ruling as to what kind of damages he's going to have to pay. Um, do you think it's going to be expensive for him? Uh, I think it probably will be uh, because of the nature of this case. Um, I mean, it's absolutely extraordinary. First of all, on Monday night, I was in uh, New Hampshire watching Trump give a victory speech, yeah. uh, having won the primary. And there was no mention of this case, obviously. Uh, it was jubilant. You know, the mood was jubilant. He seemed jubilant. He, well, he threw lots of attacks at Nikki Haley, but he was in a sort of bullish mood. Yes. And then think two days later, he'll be sitting in court uh, in a rape trial or a, mm. a trial that's to do with rape. We should be clear, though, here, um, because I think a lot of Brits are now going around saying, you know, Trump has been found guilty of rape. Yeah, he hasn't. Uh, and he hasn't. Uh, he's been found civilly liable for sexual abuse. Not criminal. It's not a criminal right. case. Uh, and this is to do with New York law, which was changed to favour historic allegations, to favour the claimant in historic allegations. And there are a lot of people, you have to be very careful what you say here legally, but there are a lot of people who think uh, that there is something very strange about uh, Eugene Jean Carroll, she is E. Jean Carroll, I should say. She uh, is a is a peculiar. She has a peculiar backstory. Yeah. Um, she wrote uh, uh, an odd biography of Hunter S. Thompson, um, in which she created an alter ego for herself, who was then uh, raped by Hunter S. Thompson. Uh -huh. um, the 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 scene that she describes uh, it, that that happened between her and Trump, the, what she claims was sexual abuse. Uh, was in fact very, very similar to uh, an episode of Law and Order, the crime show that was aired a few years earlier. Right. She was asked about that and she said it was just a coincidence. Mm. I mean, I'm not going to say whether this, whether I think this happened or not. We don't know. Uh, but the point is, it's a 25-year-old allegation 
Uh, there is no evidence. Uh, there are no witnesses. Uh, she spoke to two friends at the time, and Trump's lawyers in court today have been pointing out that they have text messages between these three friends that do seem to imply they had an animus against Donald Trump. Yeah. Again, that doesn't mean it didn't happen, uh, but it's a very, very odd case. Um, and I think, you know, as people look a bit further into it, they will start to think about it differently. And, yes. and we, we should all be a little bit sort of cautious about, you know, calling Trump a rapist because... There is no evidence. No, of course. And the burden of proof is far smaller, isn't it, for a civil case than it would ever be if it happened to be a, a criminal case. But you know as well as I do, Freddie, and we, we've got to let you go now. Unfortunately, we're out of time. But you know as well as I do, the people who do call him a rapist as a result of this case are people who just think Donald Trump is a ghastly individual and they'll call him anything they can to get away with making out that he is a horrible, horrible man. But Freddie Gray, thank you very much indeed in the US there uh, for The Spectator telling us about the latest news uh, on Donald Trump uh, and, of course, that uh, execution which is taking place being uh, very much the first time that particular method has been used. Now, we're going to go back to the Beeb. I think uh, the Beeb is under fire, as we said earlier, for casting an entrepreneur uh, to try and flog what she calls ear seeds on Dragon's Den. Giselle Boxer said they helped cure her ME, but doctors have warned that they have no medical basis whatsoever. We were talking to uh, former Top Gear presenter Steve Berry before. Uh, I think we got him back now on a much better line. Steve, uh, hopefully you can hear us a bit better now. Yeah, I can hear you great though, Mike. Excellent stuff. Very good indeed. What I was asking you when I first talked to you earlier was that this is bad news for the BBC because Dragon's Den sort of sets itself out there as a show which sort of invites young entrepreneurs and sometimes old entrepreneurs to come to them with ideas that they might want to invest in, that might turn out to be something big, that might actually lead to everybody making loads of money. But the allegation here um, from Giselle Boxer is that basically she was not um, someone who applied to be on Dragon's Den, she was actually recruited to be on it. Well, they've been caught doing this sort of thing before, haven't they? You know, getting people on for the for the kind of the age that they are, the gender that they are, mm. making the programme look the way they want the programme to look. I'm sure Dragon's Den has got no end, even after all the many years that it's been broadcasting, uh, no shortage of people wanting to come on and get some money off them dragons. But I would imagine that the problem for the BBC is they all tend to look a bit the same, yes. the vast majority of them. So if you can get an attractive, well-spoken young woman on there who doesn't look like all the other old geezers that, that drag themselves <laughs> and their products on there right. with this alter... But watching it back, because I don't watch stuff, like, you know, that'd be interesting. I think I watched a couple of programmes when it first started 20 years ago or whatever, but it's the same thing over and over again. Yeah. But when I saw it, I thought, I can't believe that they didn't run a mile from this. It was like watching some snake oil salesman in an old John Wayne movie yeah. extolling the virtues of his coloured water that he's selling for just $5 a bottle. What? It cures an illness that medical science doesn't know where it comes from and can't effectively test for it. I'm not getting in the middle of whether it's, you know, the illness itself, mm. but back in my day, a producer would have run a mile from that sort of thing. But no, no, let's stick it out there. And then, of course, she didn't keep mum. She spilt the beans and, and sort of pulled the curtain back. And there was the, uh, you know, there was the wizard talking into a horn. It's like, you know, <laughs> unfortunately, the game's, been, the game's been given away. But they all wanted to invest in it. Is that real? Yes. I think you were saying. I think you were saying that even though it's Stephen Bartlett who is the very modern and very 2024 face of that program now who's supposed to have invested in it, it's not him, it's his brother. It's yes. not looking good, is it? It's not really, no. And I've got a little Manchester angle for you as well, because apparently her pitch was the first time in the show's history that a product that she was trying to sell, or that anybody was trying to sell, received an offer from six different dragons, including, believe it or not, uh, Gary Neville, who had joined the uh, panel as a guest investor. So he was well, obviously there. fooled by it as well. Well, I was thinking if they had a celebrity edition for uh, Old Red Nose Day and they managed to get our current head of state on, he would have been getting in there before all them dragons because, as we well know, um, Charles has been a massive fan of this sort of alternative yes, he has. health treatments for many decades now. Mm. So uh, I'll tell you what, let's push aside medical science and let's just, you know, <laughs> let's just go back to the, the pre-science ways. 
Mike, listen, I've got an idea. I know where we can get a massive bucket full of leeches. Right. I'll stand on King Street in <laughs> Manchester. You in, you come in half and half with me. We'll split the money. I reckon we'll, we'll clean up, mate. We could well do. And make sure you write something like this, because this is what AccuSeeds are described as doing, right? This is on the website. A DIY needle-free ear acupuncture for anxiety, migraines, hormonal issues, insomnia, weight loss and more. And more is the bit I like. Anything you like, really. The thing about those is you could just go for a walk, a brisk walk, and it would have more or less the same effect. Right. And it would cost you absolutely nothing other than shoe leather. Yes. I mean, it's a very, very weird story. I mean, I presume uh, the BBC has got other problems to look into, but, I mean, this will just pile, you know, more uh, ordure on top of them, won't they? Because they're, they're not having a great time other than the BBC. They're not, and you know, and I love the BBC. You know, I was there for ages, and it was great, and it's, you know, a world-renowned organisation. But I wonder, Mike, if it's something to do with kind of, you know, the, the kind of long, slow, horrible death of the legacy media. Yeah. I was thinking today, when I started there, we had five people doing a job, and 12 and a half years later, when I stopped being there as much as I had been, there were two people doing that mm. same job. Yeah. And that's where the problems start, isn't it? The checks and balances that were there. The wise old head who goes, hold on a minute, this yeah. isn't a good idea. Right. That person yeah. isn't there anymore. And so these things are going to happen more and more. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Steve, great to talk to you. Glad we got the line sorted out. Steve Berry there, former Top Gear presenter, uh, with the latest ruining uh, of the BBC. Uh, this time it's Dragon's Den who's under the microscope. Um, apparently they're having to defend the show but there's an awful lot of criticism going their way at the moment and it's not looking too good. You're watching The Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Coming up after the break, we're going to plough our way through the crudeness and bad language of, well, parrots, actually, yeah. Foul beaked birds. So stick around. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. Mr Keir Starmer is uh, about to help make children even taller. Now oh, no. <laughs> that's, what, that's what's going to happen if you vote Labour. Long live J.K. Rowling and her right to stand up for women. We can only pity those who despise her straightforward politics as somehow dangerous. <laughs> The amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on Talk TV. <laughs> Sitting on his fat <laughs> talking for a living. <laughs> Like brought to you by Steve Khan, the mayor of London. You bought us with our own money, the the mayor's Thank fireworks. You. Very rarely meet anybody that says, you know, the thing about London is it's got a great mayor, <laughs> Sadiq Khan, brilliant guy. This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? I just cannot see if Rishi Sunak goes, does what David Frost, what Lord Frost wants him to do and go further to the right on taxes and immigration, that that would turn around than what's predicted by this poll. In a landslide, Donald Trump didn't just win, he obliterated. This is a guy facing nearly 100 criminal charges, and yet all that's done is actually make him more popular. Trump is canny enough to know that all publicity is good publicity. I don't want a president who's been impeached. If he's able to bamboozle you, that's the way it comes. I did my six months, I came back, nobody would touch me. I put my head down, I persisted, I carried on. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. 
Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. Welcome back. You're watching The Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. As a parent, there's only one thing that paralyses you with fear any time you think about it, and that is that moment when you fear some harm may come to one of your beautiful sons or daughters. The agony would be unthinkable, the hurt would be unbearable, and the anger would be all-consuming. We saw all three of those emotions today on the steps outside Nottingham Crown Court as the families of the three tragic victims of crazed schizophrenic killer Valdo Calacane poured out their hearts to the world venting their rage at the officials they say let them down, allowing Calacane to plead guilty to manslaughter and so avoiding a murder conviction. Barnaby Webber and his good friend Grace O'Malley Kumar were just 19 when they were brutally slaughtered on the streets of Nottingham as they were walking home from a nightclub last June, a summer's night that turned to horror as former foreign student Calacane went on a deadly rampage with a knife, stabbing innocent victims. He also killed 65-year-old caretaker Ian Coates and injured several others, but it could have been so much worse. Calacane, who now calls himself Adam Mendes, had been detained in hospital four times under mental health laws, and he had a criminal record for several attacks on people and property. He somehow managed to get back out onto the streets to carry out his brutal and well-planned attack, hiding in the shadows and launching himself at the unsuspecting victims. Yesterday, Barnaby's mother, Emma, lashed out at the system that has prevented Calacane from going to jail, slamming the failings of those who allowed him back out and accusing officials of railroading the families into accepting their fate. This whole sorry tale is a study in what this country is failing to do on a daily basis, failing to keep our streets safe, failing to stop dangerous criminals from entering our country and failing to ensure that justice is done properly. I can only imagine the heartache that these families are going through. Their lives have been ripped asunder by a judicial system that isn't fit for purpose. It makes me ashamed to be British today and I don't say that lightly. Emma addressed Nottinghamshire Police Assistant Chief Constable Rob Griffin with these words. If you had just done your jobs properly, there's a very good chance our beautiful boy would be alive today. There is so much more to say and clearly serious questions regarding this case and events leading up to this monster being out in society. But for today, our darling son, his dear friend Grace and a wonderfully kind grandfather, Ian, have been stolen from us forever and let down by the very system that should have been protecting them. Such poignant words. I've got a 19-year-old son at university, just as Barnaby was, away from home for the first time, experiencing the early years of adulthood, meeting new friends, trying new things, full of the enthusiasm of youth. To have that ripped from you must be more than any human being should be made to bear. The killer came here on a student visa years ago and never left. None of this needed to happen, and it shouldn't have. Now, moving on, a flock of foul-mouthed parrots are ruffling feathers in a Lincolnshire animal park by persistently swearing at guests. Our very own Nick Ellaby took a trip up north to see what all the beep was about. Evening, Mike. It's not just the language that's foul. This one's just crapped on my sleeve. But listen, I'm here at Lanky Lincolnshire Wildlife Park for you with 100 African grey parrots. I'm wearing grey myself to try and blend in. It's not really worked. Apparently this is one of the offending birds, so you've probably heard the story. But uh, about three years ago, this park was delivered five parrots who let out a, a lot of choice language and then they received another three and they were separated from the flock to try and sort of stop that bad language and see what they could do about it. But the problem is parrots are, you know, they're flock creatures. They need to be with a big group of, big group of their peers. So it's not good for them to be away from the flock. So what they're trying to do now here at the park is re-socialise them and see if they can stop these eight birds from, uh, you know, dropping a C-bomb or an F-bomb. I've got the, uh, the park CEO, Steve Nichols here. Steve, what's the plan? How are you going to try and get these parrots to stop swearing? Generally, it's just a, a way of... They, they pick up the most common noises. So what we're, our plan is putting them with 92 of the most common noises, like microwaves and... Uh, game playing, telephones, things like that, and hopefully they'll pick those up and stop with the really bad language, because some of the language is really bad, and even although we laugh, it is, it is quite extreme. Right. And the, the general idea is that these guys will actually pick up 
Sorry, no, these guys will actually pick up their noises and right. not the other way around. Okay. Because if it goes the other way around, anything could happen. So they could end up with a hundred swearing parrots here. Steve, people obviously come, to, they love to see these. Do you, are you getting more visitors to your park because of these animals? Without a doubt. Uh, to be honest, it's, it's worldwide. That we are getting calls every month from around the world saying, how the swearing parrots doing? And now it's gone ballistic again. So people are turning up from all over the country anyway, but we're getting, I mean, I've got somebody coming from Poland today, right. a family from Poland. I have no idea, but they turned around and said, are you open? Yes, we're actually coming to the UK. Can we come up to see the swearing parrots? Right. So one way or another, it's going to help this charity anyway. Absolutely. Yeah, this place is an international sensation because of these birds. Um, Steve, j just finally, you know, these are flock animals, as we say. Is it OK to have one at home as a pet? It's not ideal. And, and I, we know that they're out there as pets, but when you think about them, they are a, a, what we call a monogamous flock creature. So right. it's a, a pair that lives in a group. Right. And no matter how much we love them, and people genuinely do love them, but no matter how much we love them, every time you leave them, they are being isolated on their own. Yeah. And a parrot just doesn't get used to that. Right, monogamous creatures. I mean, I'm already forming a bond <laughs> with this one. Mike, I'm going to go and get cleaned up. Cheers. Yeah, keep it clean. Uh, the rehoming is clearly working because we didn't actually hear any expletives <laughs> during that clip. Uh, but we do have a behind the scenes moment of when the parrot pooed on Nick. <laughs> I, got, I had myself yeah. hearing myself yeah, back. Must it's a bit weird. Oh no! Oh no! Oh wow! <laughs> well, oh, that... yeah, eh? yeah. yeah, all over my arm. It's fine. It's a cheap jumper from Uniqlo. I can. <laughs> that's... It's a cheap jumper. Um, I'm very disappointed that Nick didn't get them to swear. You do wonder why he didn't swear when he got the parrot uh, a pooing on him. But also, I wonder where they're learning this terrible language. The panel's here with me. Uh, author and broadcaster Sam Dowler, director of communications at the Henry Jackson Society, Megan Gittos is back, and historian and broadcaster Rafe Hadel Mancou. Um, I think I would have sworn if a parrot had done that on my, on my jacket, on my jumper. But also, what kind of swearing are they doing and where are they learning such horrible words? <laughs> Well, first of all, it's it's good luck to get pooed on by a bird. Is it? Um, yes, it is. If I get pooed on by a bird in in real I life, I think people made that up just to make <laughs> feel better. So that you've just got you've got your shirts ruined, your jacket's horrible. Um, well, don't worry, it's going to be good luck. But look, the, the, the fact is, they want more footfall at the zoo, at, yeah. at the place, and like, and if you and you've got a couple of foul-mouthed birds in there, then you know, so so be it. Yeah, people... but the guy was saying they're really foul-mouthed. I mean, it's not just the occasional c well, word. It's like, know, I don't know what know, it is. We know, well, like. I, <laughs> they can say they can say a c word because it's 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 plosive like the c word the f word it's like bro you know what yeah. I mean it's, so it's they don't, they, obviously the, the parrots don't know what they're saying they're not they're not you know if, if they were you know making a sentence with want, with the c with yeah. the c word in it then maybe I do want but they're to not say, is it such a problem can't no. they put a sign up yeah. they're trying desperately I know. To, but most zoos in this country or sites they're conservationists and if they're really getting that many guests let the birds yeah, swear yeah. Yeah. yeah let the birds Absolutely. swear I'm just going to these zoos to get so I rate that they're actually saying all of these things. I mean, personally, the whole point of having a parrot is to teach it bad words. I would have thought so. Either that or teach it to say, help me, I've turned into a parrot. I think that would be rather good as well. But, that would uh, be good. I don't know, my, 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 my uh, best friend used to love his parrot. Mm. He was polyamorous. Uh, very good. <laughs> I like it a lot. Uh, but, um, but also, like, there's, there's that... Come um, a long way for that one. <laughs> <laughs> there's that... Um, there's a restaurant in London where you can go and the, and the, and the people who serve you are rude to you. They, you know, oh, really? Call, call you this, they call you that. People, oh, go, yeah, there, and people, go, there, people go there for that. They go there to be abused. So See, I'm sure people I, would go I, there just I, to I, hear I it. I lived in New York in the 80s, it was just like that all the time. <laughs> that you know, was just service. No, you didn't actually have to look for it. That was just <laughs> the way it was. You remember the soup Nazi in Seinfeld? Of course, yeah. Seinfeld, but, exactly. you know, the guy who wouldn't let you order any kind of soup unless it was the one he wanted you to have. Um, now, I don't know if you saw earlier but our uh, footballer and the, the voice change, Eric Dyer. Eric Dyer's gone over to play for Bayern Munich and he's obviously a British footballer. But have a look at what uh, he said when he was interviewed by the German press because he's changed his voice. Yeah, a very proud moment for me, obviously, to make my, to make my debut for this club. Um, it's a, it's a very proud moment for me and my family and um, obviously I, I, I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed the... Uh, Playing here, I'm happy to have made my debut here in, at uh, in this stadium. It would be a prank. Is he, well, he's doing the, he's doing the voice. Have a look at this. is This is what he normally sounds like. Have a look at this. I think the first two days have been really positive. Um, we've enjoyed training. You know, tomorrow will be actually the first time everyone's trained all together because there's been a couple of boys that are still on their second day recovery after a game. So, um, yeah, looking forward to tomorrow. But the first two days have been really good. 
it's not, it's not a prank. Like, you, no, I'm, no, I'm, this, I'm, is, this is a I'm thing. I'm in the 80s, Mike. We went to, we went mm. to France, and my, yeah. da and my dad was always like, right. you know, oh, own sandwich. And, yeah, right. and we, left a, we left a cafe, and he was like, bonjour on the way out. And it's, it's, yeah. it's kind of that thing. But well, he's obviously doing that in Germany. So he is. Therefore he's, but therefore it's a funny thing, because it's like a, it's a sort of broken English yeah. accent that's meant to sound a bit German. He's not the only footballer that's done it, though. Have a look at this. Jerry Barton did it. Yesterday I make one tackle and all everybody speak about is this tackle. Nobody speaks about uh, the 50-yard pass that kills Balmon and, and it causes a red card for him. <laughs> I mean, that's a sort of Scouse French accent. But do people um, think that it's going gonna, it's gonna, to um, translate better if I they say it in an accent? Is that, is that the thing? Yeah, I think if you're trying to you know, understand a Scouse accent or whatever on the continent, you're much easier yeah. Off yeah. trying to speak their frong I mean, I don't know what Gaza <laughs> did when he went to, went to Italy. I mean, I was always accused of doing it to some extent. I came back from living in America for nine, ten years and people accused me of being very rude because of the right. way that I actually spoke. And I would go into bars and things and say, can I get a beer? And they'd be like... That you can say please, and I was like, no, I'm not actually. Um, and then sometimes, and I went to university in Bath, and I came back with a slight West Country sort of lilt. So I think some people do it, but that seems put on though, doesn't it? But it's, it's, a, it's, simula say, Come it's on, a simulation, though, isn't it? It's it's a, it's a way to make you feel like it you're part of thing. part of it. This is going to sound um, oh, really God. bad. I I have a friend had a friend a long time ago when I was at university who had. Uh, Fa facial Tourette's, not swearing one, twitching. Yeah. I really would pick up... When I was around yeah. her, my arm would yes. also... It, yeah. it is a thing. Yeah. And I couldn't understand why it was Is it happen. called mirroring or something Yeah, like you that. start yeah. mirroring people yeah. without yeah. realising and, and you're I doing say, it. I have to say, my partner worked with um, disabled mentally and physically children, and yeah. he would come... And like, and he's like, oh, and he does a noise, and he goes, oh, one of the people do that, but he does it himself. Yeah, I can hear I him do it, it when I'm not even thing. there. It, it is a like, thing. Yeah. Like, it, it, mm. You kind of blend. I think they'd be rather good than the next series of Allo, Allo, if it came, it came back. <laughs> I was fishing by the door. Yes, exactly right. Right. But it does, it does seem to be a football thing as well, for some reason. There's quite a few English footballers. Now, a couple of stories to get to before we get to the papers. Um, have you seen this race row that's erupted in Japan? Apparently, a woman born to Ukrainian parents was crowned Miss Japan. Um, apart from the fact that I didn't even know there were still were this many kind of, you know, beauty pageants going mm. on. Um, if you have a look, I think we might have a little bit of uh, footage of this woman um, who is not actually Japanese at all. Um, she doesn't hard, look okay. Japanese. Um and she won Miss Japan. And, of course, the, uh, the Japanese are saying she doesn't look Japanese enough, so they're not very happy about it. And, of course, the Japanese is quite a sort of monoculture world, isn't it? Rafe, you'll know a bit about this. Yeah, it's about 98%, 99% um, Japanese, ethnic Jap Japanese. Yeah. And they are quite racist to non-Japanese. And if you're, if you're a mixed race, you're called a hafu, and they will actually, yeah. you know, they'll, they'll stop you in the street and talk about, or talk about you to your face like that. Right. But, you know, it's like the story of Miss Sweden, who was black, right? And, you know, like it yeah. or not, most people, when they think of Swedes, think of blue, hair, blue eyes and, and yeah, uh, blonde hair. Blue hair, that's the Labour Party people. But I think this is, just, is, is a good lesson for all of those race activists in this country who are always berating Britain for being racist. Yes. You know, challenge them, where would you like to go into the world? Because, you know, go to Japan, go to China, go to India, even yeah. go to Poland or Italy or Greece, and, and you'll see, you'll get a rude wake-up call in what racism is really like. Yes. They're very, they're very, um, they're very um, proud of their culture in Japan. Like, for example, I went to university with a Japanese girl, and she had curly hair, and she had to have a doctor's note to really? take to school to say that it was naturally curly and not, like, dead straight. Yeah. Oh, wow. It is, yeah, it is, wow. like, it is like they're... They're very. They, they obviously it's like you know, Japanese culture has pervaded the, the entire world, yeah. and and we love it. But like within Japan, like if like if we went to Japan now, we would be stared at in the street if we we're in Tokyo yeah. or something like that because they just they don't have the um they don't have the melting pot like we have here, for example. Yeah, I was in Heidelberg once, and one of my kids had just been was, was quite young, I was a push chair anyway, and all these Japanese tourists they had very blonde hair. My son and uh, all these Japanese tourists got off a bus and started taking pictures of him. Yeah. I was going, "Sorry, what are you doing?" They were like, "They've never seen a, a, a little kid with with white hair." With well, what I love hair. is Tokyo has, I think, the number one or number two number of Michelin restaurants in the world, yes. but they're all Japanese. Yes, <laughs> right. And I, get, I mean, I've never been there, so I mean, it's somewhere I probably would quite like to go. But love to go. I imagine it must be really difficult if you have no Japanese at all, because all signs and the, yeah, the signs are impossible are, to read, yeah, right? Exactly. It's not like um, if you go to Wales, for example, where there are, you know, it's it's in, nothing it's like in Wales. Wales. No, no, <laughs> no. But they don't have Absolutely they don't not. they don't cater to. They're you. not very nice <laughs> in, uh, to, to you if you're not from Wales. Though, are they? I mean, that's another story altogether. A um, couple of stories for you. Shakespeare's Globe Theatre embroiled in a rather bizarre row because um, they've got an able-bodied female uh, artistic director as Richard III. 
and some people are saying that uh, surely you should have employed a disabled actor with uh, scoliosis. A bit ridiculous, isn't it? Well, that, that is ridiculous. Uh, obviously, like, um, Ian McKellen played Richard III, famously yeah. on screen, and, yeah. you know, and he is, you know, not able-bodied. But it's it's about the actor, surely. It's not about... I would have thought so. Because you can't, you can't just go out, like, for, that's, that's saying, for example, you know, you have a movie about, you know, a, a multiple rape victim. Mm. You have to go and find yeah. that person well, this and is, hope well, that they can act. Well, this phrase that's creeping into our language, lived experience. Yeah, but this and is the a... person who's being critical says, you can't possibly have had the lived experience of being disabled if you're not disabled. Does this story is, this is so... Is person hit... disabled that's being critical? Yes. Yes, because quite often it's actually people who are the person with that lived experience right. would be like, hang on, I, no, don't speak for yourself. Right. Because often it's just, like, kind of but people also Richard, on the left But also Richard III is a barbarous character. Do you know yeah. what I mean? He's horrendous. Do you know what I mean? So that you have to find somebody who's also let's, murderous as well. Let's roll this back a minute, right? This story is hilarious because with all this outrage, this is a woman playing King, Ed, King yes. Richard III. <laughs> but that's fine. Right? Yeah. We've got There's a woman wrong playing with that. a man. That's, so that's somehow I mean, fine. That's but fine. you can't have, you know, come on, you can't also, I mean, goose, also this woman who's, who's been critical has not got any lived experience of being the King of England either. Yeah. So, I mean, presumably, exactly. you can't play that. I was going, I mean, it's a terribly old story, this, but it's a movie called Marathon Man. Very old film with Laurence Olivier and Dustin Hoffman. It. It's a great film um, about a Nazi dentist. And it's, it's terrific stuff. And apparently, Dustin Hoffman, who took himself quite seriously, um, came into the set one day and Laurence Olivier had a suite at the Carlisle and was having a lovely time and, you know, smoking and drinking and doing all this. And Dustin Hoffman came in looking terribly bedraggled. Um, and uh, apparently Laurence Olivier said to him, dear boy, what have you been doing? And he said, oh, I've spent the weekend on the streets, you know, sleeping rough because, you know, I wanted to get into the character. Method, method. But it's to get into the character. And, uh, and Laurence Olivier said, dear boy, it's called acting. <laughs> yeah. That's, another the, that's scenic, the point. You know. yeah. Yeah. That's the point, you know. Personally, I think most people agree, you know, if you're a black actor, you can't play Anne Boleyn. It's, just, it's just not really. Well, except they did no have a how, black actor. That, that's why I'm saying, that's why I'm pointing it out. That was fine. You know, no matter how good of an actor you are, I'm not going to believe you're a white queen if you're, right. a, black, if you're a black woman. Right. Similarly, if you're a woman, is, you know I don't think doesn't... you're going to be King Richard III. Right. However, if you're a good, able-bodied actor, you can convince me that you're disabled. Look at Sir Daniel Day-Lewis in My Left Foot. Of course. Look at Eddie Redmayne in uh, The Theory of Everything. Yes. You can't, that, so it's all about acting. And if right. there are some limits. However, if someone can was as do. disabled as Daniel Day-Lewis plays in My Left Foot, they would never have been able to do that, yeah. of yeah. course. So that's ridiculous, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. No, I do agree. However, I am not put off by the race thing. I thought I would be a long time ago. But you kind of forget. Mm. You do, yeah. If something's I'm, I'm, really I'm that honest, good... I'm not that bothered I'm not what they that do. Bothered. I just hate people complaining about everything. I think it should yeah. be Stop choice. bloody it, complaining. It should be artistic choice. Well, yeah. But I won't lie, when I do watch something... Like I th I've seen something... Uh, I think I saw six on yes, in the West End. And, and, and multi multiple yeah. racials. And they were supposed to be um, King... Henry VIII's, like, wives. Yeah. And you know what? You do forget. Right. You really do forget. I mean, they also, they also didn't sing and dance Henry VIII's yeah. wives all together in a, in a, in a No, in but a I've seen a lot either. of things where they've kind of changed it. I think right. there was a... Yeah, there's one at the moment where it's argue, arguing over... I can't remember who it is, where they're from, but... Yeah. Essentially, it's yeah, I do you're forget. you look for a hunchback to do the hunchback in Notre Dame, <laughs> because, I mean, you can't really find them anymore. Not anymore, I mean, so these days. They've more or less eradicated hunchbacks. <laughs> it's you and Devon, actually. Oh, is that right? OK, yeah, yeah. Well, we'll head down that way. Get down them and start casting. Check it out. Uh, see, it's the kind of information you get nowhere else. Um, here's a sneak peek for Plank of the Week, though. We're not ashamed of being patriotic around here. Raw Britannia, Britannia rolls away. Britons always, always, always will pay reparations. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. Is he happy with that now? I think he'd like, like that. He'd like that, wouldn't he? Yeah. It, yeah. It's not quite as melodious, I have to say. But, I mean, you know, um, it's got a <laughs> certain drop. charm to it, and it might pass all the diversity tests. I think so. Yeah. Well, I find it so sad because I think his view is very typical of his generation. I yes. just think that they think anything is offensive and therefore it must be removed. Whereas well, they I think... don't think at all. They just copy someone who says that. Yeah, that's Plank of the Week. That was that guy who uh, was at Meghan and uh, Harry's uh, wedding playing the cello who said that uh, Real Britannia makes him feel uncomfortable. <laughs> so he had to leave and it was being played last night at the proms. Unbelievable. Anyway, uh, Plank of the Week coming up tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. You're watching The Independent Republic of Mike Graham. After the break, the streets of London glow with an orange hue as yet another electric bus bursts into flames. I've always said you can't trust the damn things. Don't go anywhere, especially on a bus. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And you're on your smart speaker. 
criminals to using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about sport today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. Zakir Starmer is uh, about to help make children even taller. Now oh, no. <laughs> that's what, he goes. That's what's going to happen if you vote Labour. Long live J.K. Rowling and her right to stand up for women. We can only pity those who despise her straightforward politics as somehow dangerous. The amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat <laughs> talking for a living. <laughs> Like brought to you by Steve Khan, the mayor of London. You bought us with our own money, the the mayor's Thank fireworks. You. Very rarely meet anybody that says, you know, the thing about London is it's got a great mayor, Sadiq <laughs> Khan, brilliant guy. This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? I just cannot see if Rishi Sunak goes, does what David Frost, what Lord Frost wants him to do and go further to the right on taxes and immigration, that that would turn around than what's predicted by this poll. In a landslide, Donald Trump didn't just win, he obliterated. This is a guy facing nearly 100 criminal charges, and yet all that's done is actually make him more popular. Trump is canny enough to know that all publicity is good publicity. I don't want a president who's been impeached. If he's able to bamboozle you, or that's the way it comes. I did my six months, I came back, nobody would touch me. I put my head down, I persisted, I carried on. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that. Welcome back. You're watching the Independent Republican Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Now, it's time for this. The world of woke. Now, there's more trouble in the world of woke this week, I'm afraid. There's been another fire on an electric bus, and that makes the third one in just a fortnight in London alone. This one, though, has sparked calls for all the electric buses to be recalled before someone is seriously injured. This news, of course, will come as no surprise to those of us who've been warning about the inherent dangers of electric vehicles. We've already seen electric scooters, cars and even e-bikes bursting into flames and causing huge fires all over the place. Faults with batteries, dodgy battery packs, charging points usually are the cause of these fires, some of which have destroyed buildings and actually caused death. But, of course, the eco-nutters won't hear a word of criticism for their beloved electric revolution because they've all been brain washed into believing that they're actually saving the planet. Quite incredible, really. I mean, you can tell these jokers anything. This latest inferno happened in a bus garage in Putney. Single-decker 265 is operated by the go-ahead London bus company who have now launched a precautionary fleet check of all 380 of their electric buses. And it's about time, too, because it's the third electric bus to catch fire in London, as I said, in the last fortnight. Mayor Sadiq Khan is now being urged to do something. One hybrid vehicle was destroyed during rush hour one morning after it burst into flames near Woolwich in south-east London. This one was an Alexander Dennis Enviro 400 model. Just one day later, commuters were evacuated from an Optair Metro Decker bus in Wimbledon. Both buses were in service at the time. And two years ago, all Metro Deckers were taken out of service for safety checks when two of them were involved in a major fire at a garage in Hertfordshire. The problem is clearly not going away. London Conservative's transport spokesman Keith Prince said... We're calling on Sadiq Khan to withdraw these buses until the cause of the Wimbledon bus fire is understood. We're also calling for urgent checks to the fleet to ensure they're safe. Londoners need to have confidence that their bus is safe and won't burst into flames.
coming on top of the news that some financial companies are now refusing to insure electric vehicles because so little is known about what happens to their batteries as they get older, the EV business has never been under more pressure. And despite government tax breaks and sales promotions, the number of electric cars sold is actually going down. But don't tell the zealots they don't want to hear it, because that is the world of work. The world of woke. Now, the panel's all still here, so let's trawl through some of the stories from uh, the papers tomorrow. Um, and I've got the Financial Times here with me, which I don't normally have, but they've got a great <laughs> story about Michelle Moan, Baroness Moan, who's still quite active on Twitter and social media, having to go at every journalist that writes anything about her. Um, but apparently she's had her assets frozen, or at least some of them, £75 million pounds worth of assets linked to Baroness Michelle Moan and her husband, uh, basically, so that they can't sell them. This is the National Crime Agency doing this. Well, I mean, this is just this is just a continuation of the Michelle Moan, you know, saga, yeah. and it, which is in itself is a, a continuation of how laissez-faire, let's say, mm. Rishi Sunak was with the with the person yeah. during 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 COVID, because there's 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 billions gone missing. Yeah, and I do agree. Which with, most of which they're never going to see again. Well, I mean, yeah. but this but this is the thing. Obviously, when the, when they you know when for example they you know they won't give the nurses an extra percent, etc. When you know the money they lost. That went, you know, awry in mm. in during COVID. Like that, they're finally just write it off. I mean, like, are, are, are we are we okay with give, that? I just don't think we are. At least that percent they give nurses actually. At least it grows the economy. It well, yeah. promotes spending. Yeah. Um, I think she's just got the worst PR company. Like, I, <laughs> okay, uh, whoever they are, I think she should sack them if she has yes. one. If not, just I'm begging her to get some advice because just she's stop she going. is on, writing. On the checks for, mm. to hand this money back because mm. I, she just doesn't understand. This is going to play out in court, right. live. All right. the things she said and the conflicting arguments that she has, that she hasn't done anything wrong, that it was the government's fault. And everyone else was profiteering, so why shouldn't yeah. they? But that's she's the not face actually of, a the public, yeah, she no. thinks that's a defence. She's the face of it in, in, with the public. She's the face of all yeah. of that. She, so and like, she's so allowed, therefore, she's yeah. getting it all. She's allowed herself to become the person we throw the rotten tomatoes yeah. at. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And I don't know why she's done that. Get, no. get <laughs> and I mean, you know, there might be people who have a bit of sympathy for her because she wasn't the only one that did it, but she's the most high profile one. Mm. She's the one that everybody knows. I think so, you know. I feel that where I find sympathy is that she wasn't, like, she didn't set out to yeah. be fraudulent. Mm. She just didn't care that she made a decent product or that she went through mm. on the contract. And I know there's some argument that the contracts were crap and that the government's a little bit at fault here as well, the civil services. But there just seemed to be no oversight. No. I remember, she did lie to journalists about her involvement. But that was the right. I mean, there is that. Getting, getting all of this. No, but that was okay, though, because she was protecting her family. You know, but that the, was the, her the, logic. The, the important thing here... family, right? Yeah. The yeah. She is the face, you're quite right, but it's yeah. important she doesn't become the only fall guy because yeah. there are many other people yes. who must be no, that's true. held to account upon this. Like broad, I don't want broad people to think, oh, yes, we've yeah. got this one scalp, let's move on to the next story. No, we need to have forensic accountants going through all of this to try and retrieve this money. I mean, yeah, my absolutely. God, we've spaffed so much money up through furlough no. and through exactly. PPE. Exactly, where has it gone? You know, and you wonder why we're in the mess that we're in right now. Exactly right. And and it was all down to that man, Rishi Sunak, who was the leading <laughs> chancellor at the time. Um, well, now, so him, anyway. if any of you were looking, so if you were looking to buy a six-bedroom Belgravia townhouse uh, or a country estate on the Isle of Man uh, or uh, trying to get access to any accounts at Coots, uh, Seahor and Co and Goldman Sachs International, uh, she's not allowed to sell them to you. So I'm sorry about that. Um, let's talk about... Uh, Bill Roach, because uh, he is one of the longest-serving television faces. Um, Sam, you'll be able to help us with this, because I've actually never, would believe it or not, watched an entire episode of Coronation Street. I can't bring myself to do it. <laughs> I'm not a big fan of soap operas anyway. Um, but he's been chased by the tax man, aged 91. I mean, that's pretty cruel. Do you know what? Keep running. I love it. I love it. I love I love a bit of Corrie. Yeah, sorry, but... I can't make it so I'm sick. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just I love, keep I love, I love a bit of Corrie, but I, uh, but I also think, like, you know, um, if he was an actual criminal, then you know pursue. But I think you know he's he he should be blaming his accountants. Uh, the same as the same as like you know Gary Barlow when he was like, oh, I thought it was you know I thought it was this, I thought it was that. And I. Yeah. But if I he, if there was money that the accountants didn't know about, then he can't do that. Well, yes, yeah, this was of one of these schemes that people a lot of people oh. put money into. Yeah. Because they were quite often advised to do it by accountants and it was an offshore firm that was later deemed to be a tax avoidance arrangement. And a lot of people fall for it because if you're not very sophisticated mm. with money mm. and your accountants and say, this is a good thing to get into, 
Um, a lot of people get into it. And then, I mean, the tax people are a bit duplicitous as well sometimes because oh. they'll say... I don't think he ever sat is... there and said, like, oh, do this. Well, you know, a lot that, of people like... invested in the film business yeah. for a while and that was offered to loads of people, lots of people. I think Gary Lineker got involved and I think mm. um, Barlow maybe as well. Exactly. And then the, the tax people came out and said, actually, no, this is not tax deductible. And suddenly it was a problem. And what a sad predicament to be the world's oldest soap opera actor in history. I know. <laughs> and to be in this and to lose all your money at the age of 91. <laughs> and not for the first time, because he went bankrupt in the 1990s as well, after he sued the sun for, for claiming yes. he was boring. Right. I mean, that, I mean <laughs> of, of all the things to see a paper about, I would have just bitten my lip and yeah. got on with it, you know? And the boring but, and the most boring thing to go down for as well when you're 91. Yeah. Well, it's not that boring because it also is... <laughs> At least he's done something crazy. Yeah. I know. It's like... not that boring, because it says here he told Piers Morgan he bedded 1,000 women, which led to his nickname of Cockroach. <laughs> <laughs> oh, listen, he's Idiot. already my favourite Coronation Street actor. You know. I don't know. Um, <laughs> Sorry, he's not boring. Give him his money yeah, back. Absolutely yeah. right. Absolutely right. But I think um, Megan's got it right. Just keep running. Yeah, just you know. keep postponing um, the meeting. Which is obviously not technically the right sort of advice that you should give to people being <laughs> investigated by the tax authorities. Um, we spoke earlier in the show about this controversial episode of Dragon's Den. The Mirror have got a story saying that the B, this is the BBC, the other side of ITV, have now pulled the episode. Now, I'm... I'm quite good at uh, influencing the events of the uh, of, of the business that we're in, uh, but this is quicker than normal because this is less than an hour ago that I was able to get <laughs> this. Uh, and they've now said this is a woman called Giselle Boxer. Two problems with this: she's sort of flogging some kind of Chinese herbal ear nonsense, yeah. um, which has got no medical um, kind of believability at all or credibility. But also, she's saying that she was invited on to be a guest on uh, Dragon's Den, and they like to give the impression, do they not, that? People sort of um, apply and they pick them. Yeah. But she was actually approached before she even thought about it. But they do. It's like that's like X Factor. You yeah. know, they ask people to. You know, you. I think you should audition. Like, and and obviously, like this. Prob. I mean, the producers probably knew this was slightly stinky, but yeah. thought like, oh, let's let's push it because it's a TV show. It's all about the viewers. It's about like. Yes. You know, it's like making a. But program. the guy who took it up with her and decided to be an investor is not actually a member. A member of the hasn't got shares in the company, but his brother does. <laughs> so it's all a bit sort of murky. Murky, mm. exactly. So anyway, they've pulled Strange. it. Now, front page of the Times, I don't know how uh, this affects either of you or any of you. Fewer than half of adults are married or have civil partners. Uh, there was a piece of the Times, I think, at the weekend that was talking about this. They had some woman writing, basically saying that she was very happy. Um, she still had sex with people, but she just didn't have a partner. And she was, like, mid-30s, said never been happier. She said, well, there would have been a time years ago when you would have been sort of... Um, categorised as a bit weird for doing that, but there's more and more people doing it, apparently. But it for the first it time, fewer than person. half of adults are married in a civil partnership, official figures have shown. It depends on, like, whether, whether you are... Like, I know, obviously, friends who must be in a relationship. Like, you know, as soon as they're single, yeah, they I've panic, they panic. But, yeah. like, but being, I actually think being single is um, a wonderful thing because you, you know yourself better. You know, yeah. like, how you interact with other people. And, and, also, and also, if you're in a toxic relationship with so many people are, oh, then it, it detracts from you as, as a person. So I can Absolutely. understand. I can understand And I it. read this story and there was a bit in there about dating apps. I am seeing people my age, especially, they're just don't, not using them anymore. They don't mm. want to, no. It, it, Sounds horrific. I mean, I never yeah. had. I'm too old. I personally have never liked them. I have used them. But, yeah, most people are deleting their accounts now because they're just yeah. becoming futile and pointless. Right. It's pretty awful, isn't it? Just dreadful. Um, lots of other stories uh, to look at. The front page of the Daily Star, um, <laughs> this is uh, on the basis of that uh, call-up to the army the other day. As military top brass call for a citizen's army to face down mad Vlad, 90% of people say they'd refuse to fight. And health chiefs say many people would be too fat to fight anyway. <laughs> I so, would fight. I would there 100%, you go. I would would 100% go. Right. 100%. Good for you. I mean, well, I would hope they would... trend. I would hope they would, like, make me an offer yeah, or I, something. Yeah, I, I mean, I... Like me and you were saying earlier. You do it as well? I, oh, well we've got a fighting force here. I'm trying to do uh, something. Gruesome <laughs> force of now. Uh, we've got to go. Good. We're out. We're all out. Otherwise, there's going to be oh. war here in the studio. That's all <laughs> for me. Uh, you've been watching The Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Thank you to everybody. And thank you to my guests. I'll be back on your screens tomorrow, 7 o'clock. Plank of the week. Good night. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones.
I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. Mr Keir Starmer is uh, about to help make children even taller. Now oh, no. <laughs> that's, what, that's what's going to happen if you vote Labour. Long live J.K. Rowling and her right to stand up for women. We can only pity those who despise her straightforward politics as somehow dangerous. So the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat <laughs> it's like brought to you by Steve Khan, the mayor of London. You bought us with our own money, the the mayor's Thank fireworks. You. Very rarely meet anybody that says, you know, the thing about London is it's got a great mayor, Sadiq <laughs> Khan, brilliant guy. This is a major summit. President Biden.